Good afternoon. Yeah, so I'm the director of IT security or information security at Raytheon Company. And Mario asked me to come here today to talk about this advanced persistent threat, which is really is a shift in how we're applying our resources in critical infrastructures. That's sort of more about what this is about. Um, the, uh, this term, informationized force operations, is a reference to sort of a military term, uh, or, and it, it aligns very well with the, uh, another term, net-centric warfare. Uh, however, the talk is gonna talk about the broader issue. It's not a, a military issue. Uh, this is, in fact, it's kind of the point of this talk. Th this advanced persistent threat runs through all of our critical infrastructures and is an issue for everybody running um, these large infrastructures. So advanced persistent, there are only a few of these boring slides, and I apologize, some of them are in here that are just you know, text, but I, I gotta get through some of the basics. So when we talk about advanced persistent threat, we're talking about uh, people who have lots of money who are learning that the internet can be used to uh, advance their goals, maybe by uh, taking information from you or disrupting your networks, and not in the old classic hacker sense, uh, and, and not so much, although some of it's about you know, the criminal element in you know, identity theft, but that isn't what I'm talking about either. Uh, here we're, we're really more talking about uh, nation states and political groups who want to um, use your infrastructure for their purposes, and particularly so during a time of crisis. So this, this second bullet about maintaining a foothold is about being able to use your infrastructure when maybe there's a conflict going on and they want to disrupt your ability to respond. Uh, the, the other, the third bullet here about modifying data is, is kind of a scary thing, yep. No, it's not going anywhere. Well, that stinks. How about that? Better? Sweet. Okay, so the modifying data bullet is, is the scarier part. And, and that's, uh, the, the reasons someone might decide to modify your systems is to A, get it to do what they want to do or to break your products uh, when they're fielded. But uh, it also undermines your confidence in those systems during a, a time of conflict. So there are a lot of reasons why modifying the data, modifying source code in your software and other things is a bad thing. Okay, so you might have read a bit about this advanced persistent threat in the news. It's been floating around in the press probably since around 2004. Uh, you can catch articles, but it's been getting a little bit more traction lately. In fact, we're kind of very lucky uh, in this presentation because there was um, uh, a white paper put forward about a week and a half ago that caused me to rewrite this whole presentation. It was a white paper from the uh, US China Economic Commission and it put out into the public domain lots of good information that we were hesitant to disclose before, but it's out in the public domain now, so I'm able to capture a lot of that and, and speak to it here. Uh, the, the point, uh, of uh, one point of this particular uh, slide set, though, is to help explain that this isn't just about defense companies. You'll notice that it's about World Bank, and it's not just US, you'll see you know, Germany, France, uh, anybody who has you know, major you know, critical infrastructures, these are people having uh, issues with this advanced persistent threat. And so then the question is, well, you know, is, how big of a deal is this? Well, it, it actually is a big deal. Uh, this isn't uh, the little hacker thing going on. Um, uh, and then, you know, is this a new thing? Well, no, of course it's not new if, if we're talking about just stealing and spying and whatever, that's been going on for, you know, millennia. But what, what is relatively new is that these nation states and other uh, organizations have really latched on to making this part of their general operations. Th this is now, um, instead of just being a subgroup, you know, some particular specialized wing that handles, uh, you know, these kinds of operations, this is something that's now uh, higher up in the chain. Uh, in fact, you know, the, uh, People's Republic of China uh, put out a news article this year in February uh, bragging about this uh, Lanzhou military uh, region division that had just conducted uh, some operational uh, activities, training exercises in, in information operations. 
And that kind of thing didn't happen before. People didn't you know, talk about that. And uh, just a little bit more on the text slides, and I, I promise I'll try to move past the text. But I, I wanted to call this out. This is actually a quote from that um, uh, US-China Economic Commission paper. And, and this is the, you know, well, why do I care slide, because I know most of you probably aren't in uh, the defense space. And, and the reason you should care is that, one, this is, uh, I'll jump to the bottom part. These folks who are the, the APT, as we describe them, have figured out that it's easier to go after the smaller companies. They also recognize that supply chains uh, are not limited to government organizations. And in fact, they're uh, very much so not part of government organizations. And that means you folks, you're all part of the delivery chain. And you can disrupt how we move water from one part of the country to another to respond to a crisis, how energy might be transported, uh, and, and other kinds of effects like that. Right? And the uh, effect here is that if we don't respond to this and change the way we do business, uh, we're gonna have this deep persistent access in our infrastructure that's very hard to find. This is a, a non-trivial thing. Like I said, this isn't kind of the hackers trying to deface your web page and tell you that uh, you know, they disagree with your political views. This is staying very quiet and under the covers and maintaining a foothold in our infrastructures across the board. And, uh, you know, I wondered, well, how much is anyone else paying attention to this? You know, before I came here, I said, this, you know, what, what's the chance that the group, uh, you know, knows anything about this phrase, advanced persistent threat? Uh, we talk about it in, in my industry, but uh, how much do you talk about it? And Google Trends told me, hey, we don't have enough uh, search volume even to put up a graph. And so I tried, um, you know, uh, Chinese hackers, and I can see, oh, okay, well, there's some stuff there. Uh, well, what about the Russians? Eh, okay, there's a little bit there on Russian hackers. I tried American, nothing. Brazilian, nothing. French, Israeli, nothing, nothing, nothing. So there, it really isn't quite making it yet. You know, may, maybe times will change and we'll start paying attention. Uh, I'm hoping we do start paying attention. Um, so now I wanted to walk through a use case of sort of the most common way that the advanced persistent threats, uh, these groups are getting a foothold in our environments, right? So uh, it starts off with this, you know, bad guy checking out the Usenix website, let's say, for instance, and they uh, wanna see what information might be available out there. And we do put a lot of information out in the world. We're just, we share every little bit about our lives that we can possibly share. And, and then so bad guy decides to download the lease agenda and you know, packs it up nice and then takes the next step and says, I I'm gonna take this Trojan and attach it to the PDF and send it back out to the people attending the conference. And you know, well of course Bob is gonna open that attachment because you know, he's going to lease it, expects to be there and uh, pops open the attachment. And, and just in case Bob is here, because I got this off the Lisa website, you know, this isn't really Bob. Um, okay, so he opens it up and now he gets infected. And what happens? Well, his PC starts uh, beaconing back to uh, bad guys' servers. Usually those are hacked servers. They're not actually you know, owned and operated. But that changes. It really depends on the sophistication of the group. Uh, they might be actually just uh, students in training um, funded, you know, perhaps by, um, you know, a nation, but perhaps not funded, you know, it's just students. And so you get a broad mix, but, you know, when it's serious, the beaconing back is going to some other hacked website that's under the control of bad guy. And, uh, you know, obviously it's not going to be as obvious as, as the beacon going off. Um, if, if you're just for sort of first finding out about um, APT activities inside your company, it's more likely that you're gonna see more frequent beacons, which is to say just a, you know, a packet going out, uh, maybe it'll be once every hour, you know, that kind of thing. But as you, you know, find this in your infrastructure and you start locking it down, uh, they'll respond and maybe stretch those beacons out. It'll only send a packet a day, a packet a week. Uh, you know, we've seen in the industry beacons that go out once every six months. Uh, it's it's kind of crazy like that. Uh, but the purpose of the beacon is so that when bad guy wants to make use of your computer, when that connection is made, they can choose to latch onto your computer and, and then start using your machine to then jump laterally inside your environment. 
that software that's doing the beaconing also usually has uh, this you know, command and control infrastructure in it that allows them to download additional malware and install it on your machine. And I'll talk more about that later, but it's usually more than one piece of malware. Okay, so now, you know, Bob's machine is connected and bad guy's able to make use of it and they can crawl around and pull data out of your environment at will, uh, conducting various information operations if they're trying to gather information about something. Or they may simply be using your environment as a hop through station. Maybe you're going to become the next C2 site, that, that place that beacons back to. Uh, or maybe you're going to serve as a repository uh, to transfer information out. Or maybe you're going to be the next malware infection site. And I'll talk more about that later as well. Uh, so th there are a lot of ways that we all are playing into this mix. Uh, the industry, you know, we, we have seen uh, furniture stores compromised and used, uh, the, the credit union compromised, other kinds of banking facilities. And they're, they're used because they know that your employees are going to visit those sites. Or that you're going to ignore the traffic going there because it just looks like somebody's shopping for furniture. So I, then I thought I should give a couple examples of this, these socially engineered emails. So these actually came out last week, uh, pretty relevant, I think. They uh, both, in this case, talk about the H1N1 uh, flu. And so these right here, neither of these attachments are picked up by any antivirus. These are custom written code. They're using uh, zero day vulnerabilities they're not going to get caught. We, uh, in, in my company, have to, we, we wrote our own special tools and we actually processed these attachments inside special virtual machines. We actually didn't use commercial virtual machine software. We wrote our own to do that. And we decode everything, we execute it, we watch everything it does before we deliver the packets, uh, these uh, attachments to our employees. Uh, and that's how we catch these. But most people can't afford millions of dollars of infrastructure to do this, and so these uh, kinds of attacks are most often successful. Uh, as you can see, there are some clues in these messages, but it may be that your employees uh, are going to just look over them. Uh, so this right here is a real person, this uh, Michael Mallison, and it says at cdc.gov, but you'll note that it's actually a Gmail account. And this, this impersonation uh, activity has become very popular, very common for APT activities in the last six months or so, uh, where they find specific individuals you are known to do business with, and then they register those names, find some permutation that sort of makes sense, and then you'll get an email from that person that you do business with. They used to use, uh, hold on a sec. <coughs> yeah, so they used to use your own email uh, domain. So we would get a message from uh, Raytheon.com saying, or please find attached some thing and it's from maybe your boss or some other leader in the company. But uh, we, of course, you know, for the last, you know, umpteen years now have been blocking anything coming from the outside that says Raytheon.com and, and those stopped working. So that forced uh, this sort of behavior of using, you know, other freeware stuff. Plus it gives them, uh, you know, a whole set of free infrastructure to use. So it makes good sense. And, and the note at the bottom here, Adobe Acrobat, is, is by far the most targeted this year. It's, it's absolutely rampant. Um, I, I thought I should give it one more explanation here of kind of what happens. Uh, so this right, is, is a, uh, an actual <laughs> uh, snap of an attachment that was received. And, you know, but what really happens when the person's sitting and looking at the pretty bear, and, and I bet you you've received very similar kinds of PowerPoint, you know, PPS files, things like that. Um, this is what's happening in the background. So the, the system is actually reaching out and grabbing additional malware and pulling it into your machine and then setting up a foothold and very quickly uh, they come through and use your machine to hop to other machines inside your infrastructure. Um, all right, so drilling down a little bit more about these, these Trojans and the infrastructure and, and how it's used. Uh, it, it, this is the advanced part of the advanced persistent threat. There's a lot more to it, but, but the point is that, you know, we always talk about defense in depth. Well, for them, it's about attack in depth. They're, they're not going to rely on a single channel because they know you're going to be responding to it, shutting things down. You're going to get notice that, um, hey, no one should be connecting to this bad site. Maybe you'll get a smart filter update and, and your employees will stop being able to see that site. 
and so they're, they're going to move that around. In fact, they, they play some interesting games with DNS very often where they use dynamic DNS and they'll flip addresses and rotate between them, turn some of them off, uh, returning actually a loopback address instead for a period of time. So when the machine does a lookup, it actually doesn't try to beacon out, it stays off. And then they'll, they'll flip the address to an actual IP address on the internet and then your software will say, oh, and, and it actually makes it back out. Um, it's very interesting uh, sophistication, I think. The uh, notes here about VPN malware, that, that one I'm gonna drill into in a second, but uh, as, as these different critical infrastructures, we've started locking down our own core environments. Uh, very cleverly, we saw a shift to using um, a technique that took control of the, of the VPN software. And where we always set it to no split tunneling, so you can't talk to two networks at the same time, uh, they were able to get in and shim underneath that. And it checked to make sure that uh, you were not on your company network before it activated. And, and I'll talk more about that in a second, but that, that, it's a very interesting effect, I think. And then these are uniquely compiled for you. This is not stuff in the wild. Uh, that you're going to find. It's, it's always set up as a unique thing. And that means that AV is not going to do you a lot of good. Um, about the attachments, I've been talking about PDF. Th there are other attachment types. And, and this is the breakdown over 2007 uh, as published by F-Secure. Now what F-Secure is, is not uh, talking about here are some of the other methods, which is to say they might send you, a bad guy might send you a URL but the URL is gonna to lead to an attachment like this. Or that you might get a zip file and the zip might contain these kinds of attachments. But the distribution of attachments within that whole mess is, is you know, just about this. And uh, in you know, our company in particular, we've seen a lot less in the Microsoft Office environment, a very small portion, relatively speaking. It's, it's been you know, predominantly in the PDF space. And, um, you know, so, so F-Secure actually, you know, commented on that and said, well, that's just, you know, because Adobe Acrobat has been very poor about the patching and it's very difficult for companies very often to get those patches out. And I know that Adobe's working hard to, to close that gap and we've seen some good changes there. Um, now, on the HTTP side, you know, as I said, sometimes you don't get an attachment in your email. You might just get a, a link. Hey, you know, go check out this link. There's an article. Uh, and, and so these sites were compromised earlier uh, this year. And you'll note um, that some of them are tied to, um, oh, actually, some of these are actually the end of last year and then rolling over into this year. So you see election guide and some other things like that. They're using uh, Firefox zero-day vulnerability, Internet Explorer zero-day vulnerability. Uh, the uh, direct show software, uh, you know, but that, that itself is also a zero day. Uh, by zero day, what we mean is that the vulnerability was unknown to the vendor, as far as we know, at the time that the exploit was first observed. Yeah. And uh, these sites end up getting hacked and having malware placed on them so that when you go and visit this legitimate site, you pull down the malware. And I, I spoke earlier about antivirus not having um, as good of an effect as maybe we would like, and so I thought it would be useful to put up a, a bar chart here that says, well, how effective has malware been? So this is for the period of April to October of 2009 uh, with about 1,500 samples of PDFs. And you can see that for the most part, uh, it's, it's less than half getting caught, uh, some you know, very poorly caught. And there are a couple up there that, that were doing a little bit better because of the kinds of heuristic engines they're using. But nonetheless, you're still seeing a top maximum of 70% uh, of PDFs getting picked up. All right, so now uh, going down one level deeper, uh, because Mario told me you guys want all technical stuff. You're panicking me a little bit because <laughs> uh, you know, I'm more of a PowerPoint jockey and uh, you know, not so much on the technical. It's really my staff who I, I need to give kudos to who are really the uh, in-depth technical folks. But uh, what we looked at here are what kind of techniques were being used, when they were first used, when were they, uh, when were they discovered because you know, 
just because they're used doesn't mean you see it. That's kind of the point of this, that very often it will sit on your network for a very long time uh, before you discover it. So this is the, uh, it's the best knowledge we have as far as when it was first used. And of course that you know, could be earlier, but that's the first date we have. And then discovered is the first time that someone reported it, but it may not be that everyone discovered it, right? It can sit in your environment for a long time if you don't know it's there. And then the patch is, of course, when the uh, vendor provided the patch, in this case, Adobe. So the, the chart, the, the, the zero line with the red is, is when we see the patch. Um, but, you know, obviously you, you can't instantaneously patch your environment. So when you're running a large infrastructure, I, I doubt that anyone's even running the same version of Adobe inside your environment. You probably have eight and nine and all kinds of things that are running around. And so you can see that there can be very long periods of time in which there's no protection. Um, this is the timeline for the JBIG2 uh, one. And if we look back here, uh, JBIG2 is the one that has this long line on it, this, this you know, 68 days, I think it is. And so this is that 68 day chart. And there's some anecdotal evidence that w January 6th is the first time that it was used. The, the first time we see it actually uploaded to a website called Virus Total, which is a really cool website uh, that um, you can upload suspected malware to. It'll tell you if anyone else has reported it as suspected. It'll run it through a whole series of various antivirus engines and let you know who, you know, which of those uh, providers might think it's bad. And, and then you can see this timeline uh, all the way down until we see the first green patches out here when we can do something about it. In the meantime, it was very heavily leveraged. All right, so back to the bad guy. Um, this slide here is to try to help understand, you know, when we showed, you know, him taking the, the Lisa PDF, the agenda and attaching, you know, the malware. Well, this is how, at least in, in this case, how the malware gets attached. And the red parts of this are the indicators that you could use to go and find similar such malware, right? So we see an, an author field that is specific and maybe that gets reused in different cases. And then email and websites and that sort of thing. This one you can see in the, in the object three, the open action function. The open action function is one that gets called when you open up the PDF. And the, st the stuff at the bottom in the, in the seven se uh, object, that's where the actual binary executable code is. It does all the bad stuff. In fact, you can see uh, the magic byte there, the MZ that indicates that this is an executable. Um, oh yeah, so, so this takeaway on the bottom is that there's actually some very nice uh, GUI tools so you don't actually have to be all that bright. You can take uh, an Adobe PDF and load it in and then you can say, well, what, what uh, binary do I want to execute? And file, browse, click and you put it in and, and then you, you know, hit the generate button and poof, out pops uh, a malware infected PDF and send it to your friends. So it, it, this is no longer uh, rocket science. It was uh, pretty cool at the time. Now, some of the tools that you can use and we use to find uh, bad stuff, and of course we use you know, a pretty broad array of tools and change them all the time, but, but one that's uh, particularly nifty is, is Yara, and uh, you can find this up on the uh, Google Code site. And Yara allows you to run uh, sort of regex uh, you know, scans uh, with some uh, binary uh, analysis to figure out you know, do I have a PDF that matches some of these? So if you went back to that other slide that said, you know, uh, hey, these red areas have some code that you might be able to find similar things, Yara is one way that you could take and run PDFs through it and say, where else in my environment might that uh, a similar file be? You know. Okay. So it isn't just PDFs, and um, you know, the, the the behavior does vary a little bit. So that, you know, the end user might actually have no visual indicators at all, and if it's well written, they're actually not going to see much. What happens with that PDF is, you know, it launches the executable, but it actually continues to load the rest of the, the, power, the uh, PowerPoint, the um, PDF document. So they'll actually see the agenda. And they'll look at it and they'll say, oh, well, I already got that, thanks, and they close it off. 
Um, but you know, sometimes if it, it, you know, these uh, kinds of vulnerabilities aren't always well behaved, and it might actually just cause the application to crash. It might cause it to crash and then try to recover and reopen. Uh, it may actually deliberately close and reopen. Um, and sometimes you'll see the machine freeze for a little while. That freezing uh, may be while it's trying to fill up memory space. And, and so you'll actually see a, your machine running out of memory. It'll like load up a whole gigabyte of your memory before the, the uh, uh, code they want to run runs. And so th these are some of the effects that you might see. Um, there is uh, this, this monthly budget review, which is an actual malware sample, uh, is a WRI file, so WordPad. Uh, then this one here was uh, a, another PDF document used to target the uh, Uyghur community. And uh, this is a screensaver, I think, also targeted at the Uyghur community. But there, there are different packages that, that this bad stuff's going to come against you. But the, the theme here is that they're very often going to use, you know, content that you're familiar with, that you work with against you. It may not be, you know, exactly your content, but maybe your coworkers or some such relevant content. Um, th this is a, a workflow that's very common to these initial uh, C2 type applications. The, the ones that, that sit on your machine and beacon out, waiting to use your machine. So the, the first thing that it's going to do, of course, is check, do I already have this guy? Because you know, your users, they may just keep opening it all the time, and you know, it's not going to try to reinstall itself. So it very smartly goes and checks, did, did I already nail this guy? And then uh, you'll note that uh, it's like oh, three boxes down, it says uh, default sleep 30 minutes. So a lot of them will have a timer in there to try to separate the time of, of when you went to open the attachment from when the event occurs. And um, that makes sense, as you can imagine, because you don't want somebody saying, hey, I opened this up and my machine froze. You, they, they, you don't want them to associate these two things. Um, and then uh, the, the track on the left is where it's going to download other stuff. Right? And, and that's, if you remember that chart that said, you know, def, uh, attack in depth, well, it's going to go down and pull down additional C2 channels to communicate with. It'll pull down other malware to use. Just in case maybe one of them is starting to get old, maybe the AV vendors have caught up, and, and they'll pull it out. Well, they'll send down some new code recompiled that your AV won't catch. And then the, the, there's a loop at the bottom, and the loop at the bottom is just keep rechecking. Uh, do, you need, do you need me for anything, bad guy? Do you need me for anything? So now, GhostNet here, <coughs> it was a, a very public example of advanced persistent threat activity. And in this case, it was predominantly targeted at, at this, uh, the Dalai Lama and the Tibetan exiles. Uh, but you know, there were probably multiple groups leveraging this network for different missions. So it's hard for us to say exactly um, you know, the full intent of the network. And, and it covered, uh, by the time the New York Times put this out, the knowledge that they published is at about 1,300 uh, systems. And uh, it should be noted that I've been talking a lot about China, but th there are two factors here. One, every country has computers, and every country by now, and every you know, major group has figured out, hey, I can use computers to my benefit. I'm talking about China because we have this nifty uh, public domain report, and we can talk a lot more in depth about that. Uh, the other thing is that everybody who's engaged in this activity knows that it's fun to blame China because everybody's used to that, and so they want to look like China. So they're going to use Chinese computers and then say, oh, it wasn't us. You know them. So that comes up a lot, and so everything kind of looks like it's the Chinese. So don't, don't, don't take all of that uh, uh, too seriously. Um, so on the other end, right, we keep talking about the malware sitting on your machine, it's beaconing out, it's being used. On the other end, this is some of the software that uh, the bad guy gets to use to control this, this farm of machines. And, uh, you know, unlike the, the spam bot, you know, environments, uh, the purpose here is to try to stay quiet. It's, it's used much less often. It's used for intelligence gathering missions. That's sort of the difference here with the APD. Where it's not out trying to generate noisy traffic. But that said, th this um, now, Ghost Rat, even though they share the same name, uh, 
that, that just happened to be the tool that was used. Uh, there are other tools used like poison ivy. And these two tools, along with six or seven others, <coughs> are very commonly used across lots of, of bad activity. And the, the reason that we think that it's common for them to use these common tools is one, you know, of course, reuse is great, but it also gives them plausible deniability. You know, it, it could be anybody because those tools are used by anybody. If they use um, code that has, you know, their fingerprint, their signature on it, then it's easier for us to trace back and, and ascribe blame. Um, but if it's a common tool, then, you know, hey, I don't know, it must have been the other guy. But some of the things that they can do there in controlling all these environments, uh, there are key loggers, of course, that's important, grabbing passwords, uh, remote shell, uh, video control, voice control, um, and then the ability to control multiple hosts at the same time. So, so now this begs the question, we're talking a little bit about, well, who are these people? Well, this is one group. And I've divided these slides here, you know, as in the who are these people, into three groups because it's, it's likely a common scenario. And the, uh, the fourth department of, of the GSD in 2000 started moving forward. So this, this slide represents, you know, direct military involvement in this and uh, is, is when we see a change. So it was in the late 90s that I think that it's likely that many governments and uh, other large organized groups figured out that this was going to be a new activity. Rather than just being a, you know, a, a resource in the back room, you know, something that should be pulled up to the front. Well, for, for this particular group, <clears throat> it was in around 2000 that he was promoted up and his particular strategy around integrated network electronic warfare uh, was, was given credibility. And the CNA is uh, computer network attack. And then there's, there's some other phrases in there, but that's what that CNA is about. And uh, just a reminder again, we're talking about China because that's the open source discussion uh, because this report that came out um, on the China, from the China Economic Commission. So the governments you know, uh, may get involved in some of this activity. Uh, there's obviously a lot of denial about no, of course we don't really do that. Uh, then, you know, there's also this potential group of uh, the bridging of the government and the private sector. And how do they do that? Well, in this case, the, the People's Liberation Army uh, Information Warfare uh, Militia Units uh, are believed to reach out to the commercial IT sector and academia and uh, use their expertise and train the next group of people. The, the interesting part of this relationship is that you, there's both a, a strong level of organization at the top, and at the same time we see uh, internal competition, even rewards given out to different groups who succeed you know, or get something before another group can get it. Uh, there are other groups as well here. Um, the, the third unit, last time I talked about GSD, the, the uh, fourth department, the, the third department as well is known. There, there are a lot of other groups. The, um, the third department is probably responsible for a lot of uh, intelligence gathering activities as opposed to the fourth department who's really worried more about electronic warfare. And so you have different groups with different missions and sometimes uh, they'll overlap a bit. And then uh, lastly, we also have the general private sector involved in this. And so you might have um, industry organizations trying to gather information to compete against you. So if you're selling uh, computer equipment or storage equipment <clears throat> and they wanna produce a product to compete against you, uh, they may well use resources like this to try to, to get the intellectual property out of your company. Uh, the, the sort of interesting note here that I'll talk to next is about the, the uh, multiple members of varying skill level, and it kind of hints also back to the academia thing. One of the uh, things that we see is that you see different teams of people all involved in the same attack. And you might have one group, the, the first group, uh, operating with a, a higher skill level and setting up some computers for use and then handing it off to a team with secondary skills or, or that can be reversed depending on, on what they're trying to accomplish. 
So this group here, this slide talks about the tactics, techniques, and procedures that <coughs> happen at least in some cases. Again, there's no one answer to any of this because it's all different groups of people with different missions. But this particular uh, is, is a common arrangement. All right, so, so what this slide talks about is you see this foothold host on the left, that's the person who gets socially engineered uh, up front and they end up getting that software on that's beaconing out, right? And that's gonna latch the computer and make it available to the bad guy, okay? So they're gonna download and install software maybe from some other hacked website, which is that thing in the top left. And that's the stage zero environment. And I talked about that VPN software, which I'll discuss in a second that helps actually separate it from your network. So even though I'm showing the guy here sitting in the orange cloud, your network, part of the time they're actually sitting on the internet, which is like outside your network, right? So once you're, that machine is compromised, this A team, perhaps the more senior people, maybe the professor in the classroom, um, uses the machine to come in and compromise an intermediary host. Uh, the ways that that's done vary quite a bit, but you can imagine uh, maybe you use the same administrator account on your PCs inside your company. Um, you know, maybe it's the same local administrator account with the same password. So once they get on this box and get that SAM file, they can just jump around and get everybody else. And now they can install software on all those machines. And then once they've done that, they want to keep that foothold quiet, right? So they want to use it again because that's the way they're getting out. So they're not going to hand that off to the other guy. They're going to take that intermediary host and give that to the B team and say, okay, I've set up this computer for you. Now you can use it to go and get the data. So that group, their mission might be just to go and find information assets inside your environment, your intellectual property, uh, other things of interest. And they're gonna use, more often than not, these GUI tools. In this case, we're showing RDP, terminal services, and they're, so they're looking around inside your environment, connecting, and remember, they've got your administrator account now. Maybe they uh, deliberately went after and found uh, who the administrators of your uh, in, uh, Active Directory are, then they go and they tip the uh, domain controller and grab all the passwords, so uh, they might now have access to all kinds of machines. Once they do that, they're gonna go and try to find information and transfer it out to yet another site. Most often, again, that's gonna be another hacked site so that they don't get attribution back to them. All right, now on the VPN client I talked about, which was on that left-hand side, uh, as, as we all have tightened down our networks and gotten better about blocking stuff and, and looking for, for activities, they realized that people take their computers off your company network and bring them home and they plug them in at Starbucks and they're you know, at the hotel room and that's a perfect time to make the communication. So this particular set of software that's been reverse engineered here, which is why you see these you know, zero, zero, 001, two, three, four, that's just an artifact of the reverse engineering. It uh, recognizes when you're off your network and that's when it beacons out. And it sets up uh, a, a route using your router at home, that default gateway, and it'll only go out that channel just to beacon out and connect back to the bad guy. But the rest of the time, it's gonna jump through your VPN client and come into your internal network. And so it actually defeats the uh, split tunneling. And it's doing that by um, uh, jumping onto the NDIS driver. And so uh, you might have noticed that uh, Cisco is uh, just one example moving away from the NDIS driver, but all of the major VPN providers were all using the NDIS driver. And the NDIS driver did not require, um, uh, you know, assigning. And so anybody could latch onto the NDIS driver and jump onto your network. Uh, the, uh, it's a DNE, uh, if you're familiar with the uh, deterministic network enhancer driver. All right, all right, so a little bit more on the TTPs. Um, this slide is meant to be, um, I got a little movie thing there, cool. A little bit about, you know, uh, there are other things besides the technical that I think you should pay attention to. And this goes to the, the issue of putting information out on the internet. <coughs> All of our companies put um, data out on the internet and, and many of our employees put information out there. They have Facebook pages and other kinds of things, and they talk about maybe their role in your company, uh, who they're doing uh, business with, who they're associated with, what products they use. All of that is information that's of value. 
So this open source analysis is going to be used by the bad guy against you to target very specific, specifically the people in your company. This isn't um, a generic operation of like spam, like, hey, I wonder who's going to bite. It's actually targeting specific people. And they don't have to be the technical gurus because remember, they're only trying to get into the environment to reach out and get that data further down the chain. So these initial hits, they're trying to find out about maybe even the weaker aspects, the weaker links, the people who are out giving speeches like this and handing out their, their uh, email address. But you can then use that fact to, to combat that. You can go see, well, what are we publishing? And more importantly, what are they looking at? So you can go through your web logs and say, who is looking at my website? What information are they looking at? And that's a really important fact. We've actually stopped a lot of activity by just looking at our website, looking in Google Cache, looking in other places where, th where they might be looking to find information about us and seeing what they're seeing. In the attack phase, we talked a lot about that socially engineered email, website uh, work. Well, for that, that requires awareness and monitoring and sharing, and I'll talk about the sharing part, which is basically about this event here. We have to work together. This is not a thing that any one group is going to be able to combat. It's something that we have to do together, which is why uh, I'm permitted to stand up here and have these kinds of dialogues. A few years back, uh, this would have been verboten. Talking about this in public, I would have, somebody would have charged that door and tackled me off the stage, and I'd be sitting somewhere else. The um, lateral movement phase, this is <clears throat> after they get that, that you know, the, the weak gazelle in, in the environment, uh, then they start hopping around and, and getting other machines. So as they're trying to establish these new footholds, and, and typically what we'll see is when a company gets a few machines uh, compromised and they're sitting there, then they go and find some and they, t they go and they clean them up. Um, very quickly, a few more pop up. Uh, and, and so it's a very difficult task. If you just leave one behind, you're going to have them jump and plant a few more footholds, and, and they're just going to reestablish themselves. They don't want so many that it's easy to find, but they're going to scatter them around. And <clears throat> we, we've you know, sat there running decodes you know, throughout the night, watching them try to jump through uh, people's networks. Uh, so you need to monitor for that inside your environment. It means picking up net flows in your environment and, and looking at the flow of traffic from one place to the other and segregate the networks. Don't make it easy by having flat open networks. If you've got um, a box of uh, email servers, then you should be putting firewalls just in front of those that say, hey, these are the authorized ports and the authorized servers. And you know, for a long time, at least, my company, we spent a lot of time trying to take out the firewalls, right? You know, we had all these one company initiatives because we were made up of different companies, right? We had, you know, Hughes and TI systems and E-Systems and Raytheon, and we all came together as one company. So we spent a lot of time pulling down the firewalls so we could all become one company. And oh my God, let's get those flipping firewalls back in. So the command and control and exfiltration phase, this is a very important element where in order to be successful, they've got to get back out. Right, so that means that you need to take a lot of time looking not at who's attacking you from the outside, although that's important, but look more importantly on what is going out, when it's going out, what vectors it's going over, and maybe doing some statistical analysis on does that make sense? Why would that be happening now? Why would I see this versus that? Okay. All right. So the. Uh, I won't, I've been talking a lot about words here, so I'm going to just jump to the IPO part. So uh, the, the uh, input process output, I don't know how popular that is in the world, but I'm a huge fan of the IPO diagram, figuring out what the gazintas and gazatas are of, of any system. Um, if you don't know what that is, then um, you're going to have a very sloppy network. You, it's really important to, to figure out for any either system or subsystem the gazintas and gazatas, and then that's how you can monitor and put the proper ACLs down. But uh, I, I'm going to jump forward here a bit because I feel like I'm dragging on this. Uh, on, on the awareness piece, we've had a huge amount of success with this. Um, you know, for years we thought it would just be annoying and the employees don't want to hear about this and it's our job anyway. Why are we doing this? But, you know, social engineering relies on ignorance. So it's really important 
that you communicate out. And in fact, th when I made the, the, the comment about not being able to talk before about this, there, there's been a sea change over the last couple of years in the defense industry that said, you know what, we need to tell people about the problem because uh, there's no other way that we can get this solved. We need everybody working on this problem. So if for us, we, we created a whole brand around this, RTN Secure. We have annual awareness training that talks about these kinds of issues, these special events and symposia. We have uh, you know, the giveaways and all that kinds of tchotchkes, um, lots of articles. And then the, the thing that I think is really cool that we've done is we now do targeted training for specific high-risk people. And by high-risk, we mean people who we've seen targeted in the past, who we see um, open source collection gathering happening. So maybe they haven't received any messages yet, but we see a lot of searching and Googling about that person. Or maybe they put their email address out on the public homepage or out on the internet because they gave speeches at some conference. And, and we know that, that that email address is getting hits. And so we go and we say, look, see this, Bob? This is all the information about you we just found out on the internet. And by the way, here are the web logs that say these are all the people located in these countries who we don't do business with. Yeah, they just pulled down all of this information about you. Why do you think they maybe did that, Bob? All right, so this is what we need you to do. Watch out for in inbound junk. Don't click. I know you want to click. I know it says unsubscribe. Don't unsubscribe. They don't really unsubscribe when you do that, Bob. So th this awareness has been really helpful for us. Um, all right, I won't get too preachy about the IPO diagram, but, but honest to God, it, it's a, a big deal for me, compartmentalizing your environment. I know it's, it's actually all tried and true from, from a long time ago, but it's just as important now. And I don't mean to go against you know, the whole you know, Jericho thinking, because I'm actually a big believer in that. But at the same time, you've got to improve your signal to noise ratio. You've got to screen out the known bad junk. It just doesn't make sense to let that continue to hit you because it's harder to analyze mounds and mounds of data. If you can just screen out the garbage so that you're down to just the expected behaviors, well, now you have a much better shot at understanding the things that are flowing. And that you, you need to do at multiple levels inside the environment. It isn't just at a network level or a system level, but you know, even down to the data level, if you can pull it off in databases, you know, what, what function calls are making that, what does that make sense? You know? <coughs> And now, so then we talk about the outbound side, if you remember, and, and watching that. So now th these folks who, uh, by the way, I can't say enough good things about Mandiant, who have been very helpful for us uh, and uh, their associate virus total. Uh, they, they did analysis on thousands of samples of APT malware, right? This is that custom written junk that shows up in all of these critical infrastructures. Uh, and they've been very helpful in all of these uh, CI areas of, of trying to help clean up this problem. So 100% of their samples all have an element of outbound control in order to make them function correctly. So that means that we need to look at that outbound control. And then this, this note here about driving down dwell time, instead of counting the number of infections, like, oh, you know, this one, that one, the other one, uh, that, that's not so much a measure of success. It's a measure of success of your awareness program, maybe. but. Um, the more you know, you ramp up awareness. You'll see even other kinds of you know, larger attacks and larger. Um, the, the, an important metric to help you decide if you're, if you're doing a good job is dwell time. And dwell time is how long did that piece of malware sit there and make outbound connections before I was able to stop it? And you'll find if you focus on that particular aspect, you can drive that down in a big way, and you'll see things that you didn't see before. And again, back to the speech of, yeah, don't forget, still screen out the crap. Signal to noise ratio is important. Okay, I won't make my joke. <laughs> so sharing is another really important part. It was, again, a sea change for the defense industry. Collaboration is cheap. It didn't cost me much, but a plane ticket to get down here. And you can use other people's money, and that means that your return on investment is going to be very high. It also means that your company doesn't have to admit you are compromised, only that you have clever enough security people, uh, information people, that you were able to find this and stop it. So, you know, kudos to you. But the sharing part is to share, I found some malware, here's a sample. I found some known bad sites, and here's what they are. Uh, IP addresses of, of uh, places that bad guys trying to get to. 
And uh, I've got a slide coming up that says, you know, places where you might share, but uh, in the defense industry, we have our own circles. And my team uh, cautioned me. They said, hey, Michael, Fight Club, Fight Club. We don't talk about the, the, the group. So I can't tell you the name of the group, but we have a group of us and we get together and we share information. And uh, see, where's Matt Richard? I didn't do it. So uh, th some of the other techniques that we have here um, that they use, dynamic DNS is, is really prevalent. As you can imagine, it really just makes sense on their part. So they're moving around, they're not sticking in one place. And there are some well-known, uh, really bad dynamic DNS uh, folks. And there was another uh, study done not so long ago that said it was like, you know, 100%, I think, if not, it was 100%, it was like 99.5% of every single site hosted on like the Russian business network is entirely all bad stuff. They just don't host any good stuff. Um, so they use that for a lot of this bad behavior. And they also uh, use uh, DNS as a covert channel. And, and by that, I mean, you know, these are your, your um, desktops and servers and other things making DNS requests but they're not DNS requests. They're actually, there's actually data in there going out and the reply might actually be data. So the IP address you get back might be 255.255.255.8, right? And if you get a, a, a .8, then that means I want you to go to sleep for eight days or, or something like that. And, and so this is the kind of thing that goes on. So the, the lessons that we can extract as infrastructure people is, well, all right, I should at least block the quote uncategorized websites and then I can whitelist the uncategorized ones that are real business. But at a minimum, I should be blocking the uncategorized ones. Um, we employ split DNS and split routing. And that means that we don't allow the machines on the internal network to look up addresses on the internet. They have to go through a bastion host, so a proxy server, some other gateway. Um, and the same thing with the, the, the split routing. We don't route our internal network to our outside network. The two are separate and you have to go through a bastion host. And what that means is that a lot of the, at least the, the dumber malware that isn't gonna go and manually be set up and configured to use your proxies, it's just not gonna function. But then that gives you other benefits too, and I think I'm gonna talk about that later, but if you're doing that and you see a piece of software trying to do a DNS lookup uh, of an internet address, well, it's either A, just misconfigured legitimate software, but very often what we find is it's bad software not always APT, it might just be some peer-to-peer -peer file sharing garbage or some other kind of infection somebody picked up when they brought their computer home. <clears throat> but, but you actually now have a whole other mechanism for finding bad things on your network. You know, somebody trying to get out to um, an internet IP address that you don't route to. They're not going through the right gateway, so it's another clue to you. Somebody's trying to get out to a place but doesn't even know our infrastructure well enough how to get there. Uh, some obvious things, I, I apologize for those of you who just kind of went, oh, please. But the, the bad attachment types, and you can look them up on Symantec and McAfee and others who provide lists of such, you know, recommendations. But really, you can do it. And, and we block, you know, zip files as well. And, you know, everybody screamed and hissed, uh, am I not right, Mara? And for a while, but you know what? Everyone got used to it, and then everyone else was doing it, and we got used to it. And again, that doesn't stop the sophisticated attacker, but it's that signal-to-noise ratio thing. It gets rid of the dumb stuff, and now you can focus on the more important things. Um, if, if you're um, funded well enough, and, and you, can, you can do your full packet captures inside your network and get the net flows and other kinds of data, look for that magic byte floating uh, around through your gateways because that means somebody's trying to transfer an executable file through. And sometimes that'll be legitimate, but sometimes it won't, and it gives you some place to look. Uh, obviously, checking proxy firewall logs and other things like that for the port 22s, the 6667, those things um, are indicators that, that bad stuff is happening. Um, so th I included this one up here because it lists a series of those dynamic DNS domains and there's a great article from F-Secure, again, another fantastic company, and there's a URL stuck at the bottom, and I guess I'll post these up later so everyone will have it, but there is a great article here, and they have a million others, but they're actually listing a series of known bad sites, so it goes to that sharing thing. These folks are sharing, make use of it. Um, th this is related to this topic. Um, all right, more stuff to look for back home. 
All right, so some of the things that have yielded fruit for us. Um, the chart that's sort of obscured there a bit at the top, uh, that's, that's looking at um, flow data and looking at um, long sessions, right? You know, how long, so the stuff way at the end, some of it's gonna be legitimate, but a lot of it might not be. Why is that machine holding open a session out on the internet for this long period of time? You know, again, you know, it's that signal to noise ratio. Once you whitelist it in your, in your thing and you say, all right, these are all the machines we know are gonna make, have that kind of behavior, but I kind of know the source and destination. I can, <clears throat> you know, write a script to pull that out and ignore it, and now it's gonna start uh, flagging any of these other weird uh, activities. Uh, the other one that's sitting on top is, is a way to uh, analyze your net flows and look for that kind of C2 traffic. <coughs> the beacons come on a regular basis, <coughs> pardon me, and those are those flat sections of the line. When the bad guy gets on the remote end and starts typing and sending those commands down to your keyboard, that's when you see the fluctuation. There are things that behave like that, like you know the webmail tools that are always checking, to, hey, do I have mail, do I have mail, do I have mail? But you'll know what those are and you can whitelist those or at least get them out of your, your traffic for the time being. I would um, not recommend ignoring those completely, you know, but uh, uh, at least for in the beginning, you know, screen that out. Uh, there are some other things that'll have that behavior, IM tools, right? Uh, th so this chart down at the bottom, the, the radial chart, is looking at RDP sessions, but you can look at all other kinds of those graphical uh, remote session traffic sessions. And, and take a look at that, and if you map it out like this, you can see uh, communities of interest working with one another, and a lot of them will make sense, and you'll say, ah, I expected this. But wait a minute, why is this guy initiating an RDP session to this machine over here? That doesn't make sense. Bob and Alice don't work together. And that, that would be a clue that somebody's running around your network. Um, this, this one here, user agent strings in your proxy logs, uh, we've found that a lot of the malware deliberately uses somewhat broken user agent strings. They look kind of correct, but they'll change a period to a comma or a dash or a semicolon or some other kind of thing like that. And, and they do that so that the bad software on the remote end knows when it's the malware talking to them instead of somebody running a regular web browser. Right, so somebody says, oh hey, this is a bad IP address, and then you go and you launch your Firefox and you point it at the IP address and up comes a regular web page. Everything is great. Because your user agent string is a legitimate one. You're not using the specially coded user agent string. So if you go and pull a Pareto chart of user agent strings in your proxy logs, look at the little stuff at the end. Why are there only a couple of those? That makes no sense. And so that's a theme that I would encourage you to think about. Get your guys working on scarce records. Um, everybody has all of these software packages on their computer. So if I analyze my environment, I've got 50,000 copies of this, 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 and this. I've got four of those. Why do I have four of those? That's kind of weird. Some of it's gonna be legitimate, maybe. Maybe somebody just wrote the tool and shared it with his buddies, but you know, very often, those few scarce records, they're gonna be the weird ones. Uh, it might be DNS lookups. You know, people go to Fox and CNN and this and that and the other thing, but you know, I'm only getting 10 hits to this IP address. That's kind of weird. Let me take a look at that. So th th that idea of scarce record analysis is, is an important one. Um, I, I spoke earlier about virus total, and I thought I should give them a, a, a chart, a slide here, and it goes to the sharing theme. So this is another great group here, and I, I, you know, hooked in with the Mandiant and folks. This this. Um, is where people will say, hey, I've got this malware sample um, that I, at least I think it's malware. Has anyone else seen it? Do you think it's malware? And, and you can actually see that, and not only that, but you can kind of see when the other person might have first uh, submitted a sample. So that's virustotal.com. Um, more on the sharing theme, there are a whole series of collaboration groups, and you know these are specific to, to you know, my world. Um, but except for the InfraGuard one. Now InfraGuard's open to all of you folks, and I would encourage you to at least start there. Maybe that's where you can make some connections, find out who might be involved in your industry in a, share, a sharing environment, and maybe 
you can actually get one started yourself if you find that your particular critical infrastructure group or industry doesn't have such a way of saying, hey, have you seen this before? Hey, I just found this bad stuff. We have our own, um, but you know, I think every group should have one. I've seen a couple startup, I think banking is doing, you know, a, a real bang up job and, uh, you know, defense. And I see uh, the Homeland Security groups starting in that space. Um, the, uh, th th this is another one of my preachy slides. I guess I have a few of those, don't I? Why didn't you warn me, Mario? <laughs> so this is on the, the uh, IPO thing, developing the systems. It isn't just about networks. So. And I, and I kind of got into that. But the, the one on the right-hand side, th this is a speech I've been going on uh, for a while. I, I actually went and spoke to the White House and Congress in 2004 about this problem, saying, you know, we've got to stop leaving this up to the end user to defend the national infrastructure. Um, and so, uh, you know, even you know, then I said, uh, you know, my poor grandma on her computer is, is out there trying to defend against attackers from foreign nations, it's flipping crazy. You know, so uh, I'm hoping uh, to try to get this message out that maybe governments need to step up and think more about this. And I think we're seeing some of that. Same time I am a, a libertarian and I, uh, I'm a little nervous about that thought at the same time. Hopefully we'll find that right balance. Um, this is sort of summing up all of that and I have one more technical slide just because Mario told me to. But the one more technical, <laughs> the, the last uh, preachy slide here is that, you know, we can kind of blame, you know, APT or blame this country or that country for misbehaving in the world and that kind of a thing. But you know what, we've all thought about this problem for a long time. I mean, we knew it when the Cylons attacked us and it was really bad. I mean, do you remember that? And we all went and disconnected all of our computers and then we seem to have forgotten that. And we went back and we plugged everything back together. and. We have to start thinking that we are all causing potentially a problem for everybody else and we need to uh, put in those defenses and maybe not blame the other guys so much. Uh, so that's, that's my push to take responsibility. Um, all right, so we're jumping back to the technical stuff. Uh, some of the emerging things that came out of TorCon, uh, which was only you know, some weeks ago, I guess. Um, uh, TorBase C2. So Tor is that network of anonymizers. And uh, it, so there's been a shift toward trying to run command and control through an anonymizing infrastructures. <coughs> you might also see other kinds of cloud computing services, uh, anonymous kinds of, of infrastructures being used to transmit this information. The um, malware design, uh, designed to infect NCASE workstations, I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, but you know, NCASE is a forensic analysis tool. When we have something bad happen, you know, in comes the security people and they grab your hard drive and they image your system with you know, very often NCASE. Well, obviously bad guy figured that out, wrote some stuff that says as soon as somebody tries to load this image into NCASE, I'm gonna you know, infect the NCASE machine itself. Now, as I understand, NCASE uh, had that vulnerability in version five and they fixed it in version six, but, but the, the um, idea of going after the investigator is not a lost idea and continues. And we've seen similar situations where uh, a bad guy actually made somebody's computer look like they were surfing porn. And uh, so the guy's just working there, actually it was out in your area. And so the guy was you know, surfing porn and the security people show up at the machine and they say, oh, geez, I can't believe you're still doing all this, this is crazy. And they, and they sit down and they log in as administrator to try to look at the logs to prove it. And as soon as they log in as administrator, they grab the admin password, boom, done, you're, you're out. And it, it, within you know, 30 minutes, it, it was just a mess. So um, going after the administrator, uh, that, that's the thing. And, and there's a bullet down there going after security professionals, new target. That's been uh, very successful and I think is gonna propagate. <clears throat> the, the size of the malware is getting really um, small. And that's because they figured out that you, know, you don't need a lot to get as far as uh, being able to pull down new malware. So the initial load can be really, really small, which means that it's a little harder to find. You know, these tiny little transactions get you know, very hard to trace. Same thing with like spreading those beacons out. You have to capture a lot of traffic to say, oh, I saw one packet. 
a week later I saw another packet and trying to correlate those two, very tricky. Uh, I noticed ArcSight's here today and, and ArcSight has some people who are, are very good at helping to us, um, help us solve that problem. Um, intentional worm outbreaks, uh, that you can imagine what that's about, but that's hiding in a storm of crap. Um, uh, Brandon Gilmore uh, has a, a page up that talking about uh, portplex and that's kind of to me similar maybe to uh, that idea of changing the user agent string and saying if you're looking from this angle I'm going to give you one thing but if you're looking from another angle I'm going to show you something else uh, and, and that's I, I think rather interesting. Um, browser data theft instead of installing a key logger actually using some vulnerabilities to grab your keystrokes dra directly out of your open browser that's just sitting open. Um, the idea that, remember I was telling you that they go after uh, websites that your people visit. And, um, you know, so at one time it was just sort of guessing at, you know, where the people might go or that kind of thing. And then they said, well, well let's just look at the source. So they'd hack the proxy logs of your system to find out where your employees go so they can figure out what system to hack to get the people and actually stay out of your environment afterward. They can go after the websites that your people visit. Um, this, uh, the mail header harvesting, probably not all that new, uh, but uh, th this other one of minor config changes and rolling back just to one, you know, you install a patch and then just uninstalling the patch or rolling back or making other minor changes. Uh, that, that that's, you know, seems to be a, a theme here. And uh, that's, that's pretty much the show right there. Uh, any questions? Yeah? I can't see what the light, but, oh good. Uh, okay, so we, we should let people first point stuff. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> Get started right away. <laughs> okay, Rick Farrow. Um, I love the talk, really good. I, I really, um, well, I have to say that I was seeing a lot of these things almost 10 years ago, yep. including to you guys and in particular. And, um, but the, what I really, you know, what you're trying to do is to, you're sticking fingers in dikes, essentially. Yeah. You know, you're trying to plug up all these holes, and yet the points in penetration really happen to do with a, a series of applications that actually work through the web browser. Okay, people go, they download stuff. This is really the huge point of vulnerability today. Yeah. So what we're not seeing, you know, I'm, I'm a, a much bigger fan of looking at things a slightly different way and saying if we give people sharp edge objects like knives with no handles, which is what a web browser is today, then they're gonna hurt themselves and actually they're hurting other people as well. So it would actually make sense if we actually started to use some technology, and it could be virtualization technology, it's not the best, to run these kinds of dangerous applications in some kind of a sandboxed environment so it doesn't infect their whole computer. Yeah, flipping brilliant. We've just started looking at that ourselves and okay. trying to figure out how to do it in a cost-effective way. Right. Uh, it's the operational management of it is the hurdle we're trying to get around. There's a little bit of maybe MVED and I think, you know, the, there's some VMware tools that are getting in that direction that give you enterprise scalability. But I right. think you're absolutely right that it goes back to that segmentation comment about, mm -hmm. you know, if, if this is an inherently dangerous task, but we want people to be able to do it because they can't innovate just doing exactly what they've always done, right? And we're an engineering company, so we need people to have new thoughts, and we can't, so we can't squeeze them too much. It's just, just, so we need to find safe places for them to go and play, like I said, play in the sandbox. Sure, yep. play in the sandbox, or take away Adobe, everything Adobe, especially Flash, yep. and everything in Microsoft Office, and you notice all of a sudden that, that giant Venn diagram you had where it shows mm -hmm. sources of infection, all, most of it goes away. Yep. Now, that'll change. As soon as you move away from that, somebody will say, oh, now they're using Macs, whatever. Mm -hmm. Anyway, yeah, maybe I'll off offline. But I'm hoping that somebody out here comes up with a great tool to help us with that. We've been struggling with it, trying to come up with uh, our own to do the same. Yeah, I think that's the right way to go. I, what should, no, sorry. <clears throat> uh, question for about companies that are dealing w with a lot of business in China they have a lot of business partners in China. What threats should we be concerned with from the business partners? Okay, let's see. <laughs> Thinking about um, my uh, <coughs> father here. Uh, let's see. So yeah, I, when it comes to China, I would recommend 
that you, you follow that segmentation model and don't open up parts of your network that you don't need to have opened up. Uh, that, that's, you know, for certain. We also, you know, do business there just like probably everybody else in this room. And, uh, you know, I, I, there's, um, you know, a, a pressure in our industry to have everything opened up. You know, I'm, I'm an employee, I, I should have access to the same systems. And, and I think that you have to kind of resist that. And, and there's been a bit of an industry push in that direction in the identity management space of figuring out, you know, access roles and what people need. And then we've seen, um, you know, the Cisco Mars kinds of tools that say, you know, if I log onto the network, I only get to the things I need. That, I think that's the direction we need to go. Um, the other thing, I mean, more practical near-term stuff that we do for folks who are traveling, uh, we have a clean laptop loaner program where we don't have them take their life's work with them. The machine that they've been, you know, so if they're just a temporary traveler, you know, I'm going there for a couple of weeks, don't send everything that they've ever done in their entire career with them. Give them a clean laptop, have them put just what they need on there, let them use web-based email back home instead of their entire archive of email they might have, and, and uh, have them travel with that. Uh, you know, obviously we employ encryption on all of the, the mobile devices, but if the advice we have to give our employees, of course, is, you know, if, if somebody in, you know, government X tells you you have to give, put your password in, then you put your password in. You know, you don't, you don't fight with some foreign government, you know. So um, knowing that, you have to make sure that uh, you don't have a lot of information on that machine, just what's needed to get the job done. Uh, other than that, uh, legal protections are improving in China, and um, they actually just passed some interesting anti-hacker laws this year. I think they became a little bit of a victim of their own successes. They've really grown a lot uh, in sophistication, and it spilled out way beyond uh, the military space, and the, their universities are really brilliant in, in the information warfare space. And as a result, there are a lot of people out there using those tools, maybe beyond what they expected. And so there were some cases of uh, Chinese banks being hacked and other stuff like that. And so the, the, the point of it is that there has at least been some push in China to tighten down and maybe not be so permissive about hackers. Right. Um, everything you've explained is, uh, has been predicted in science fiction, so. Yeah, that's why I have the Cylon up there, yeah. dude. I, he's like, I'm like, I'm sure I read this in 1983 or something, you know? Yeah, are your slides gonna be available? Yeah, I'll, I'll put them up uh, okay. with, with these guys. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Sure. Steven Spackman. Um, it's interesting, actually, that you just said that about the Chinese. Um, I noticed during your presentation, you talked a lot about the actions of the bad guys. Um, if you're Chinese, uh, you feel that the Chinese are the good guys. If mm -hmm. you're French, you feel the French are the good guys. I had the same thought driving over here. I was like, hey, wait a minute. <laughs> and I presumably if that. you're American, you think that the Americans are the good guys, but I'm not American. I have no particular reason to uh, think that way. And so I wonder what America's part in all of this. And then we had this question about the use of Adobe software and Microsoft software. Mm. And I find myself, I've long wondered why the federal government doesn't simply say that the federal government will not purchase software that is supposed to display a document, but instead will launch an executable or open a network connection. Mm. Um, it's a very easy thing to prevent. Mm -hmm. um, so is this something that I should be worrying about? Is this, are we subject to loopholes that are, if not put there on purpose, at least permitted on purpose because it's calculated by someone somewhere in some dark room that there's more advantage to opening up the rest of the world to attack from the U.S. Mm. than there is to locking down the U.S. from attack from the rest of the world. Yeah, I, we've definitely had those conversations, at least in our circle, when you could buy enough beers and people are sitting out there, uh, you know, and, and I honestly believe, no, I do get, you know, to have a lot of conversations with folks about this sort of thing. I think what it is is that we, people, humans, want um, options, right, and flexibility. And so I think the reason those capabilities and tools are in there, like the reason Acrobat does JavaScript and allows this is because, you know, somebody said, you know, it would be really cool if I could get this Adobe software to talk to a back-end server and dynamically update these fields to, say, fill in your address right off of the company LDAP. Wouldn't that be cool if we could do that? And so I think that's what happens. And then when it comes down to the government side, the government is, 
and I've done a lot of work with the government. I worked on various groups and things there. What's, they're really the same people. They're just your neighbor down the street who just happened to have that job. And they're under the same kinds of pressures. They're watching the same advertisements on TV. And there's a huge push. Uh, in fact, we were talking about outsourcing earlier. The government has that same thing of, well, you know, we should be reaching out to the private sector. They're doing this much more efficiently. We should use the same uh, techniques. You've seen, actually, that uh, this year, we, the government put out uh, cloud computing specs in the GSA, saying we're going to buy cloud computing services. And you might think to yourself, my God, why would we ever do that with government data? But there we go, because people working in the government are very tightly tied to the private sector. They maybe had a job there last year where they were very successful, and they got took this job or vice versa. So I really don't think that it's any evil group. I don't. But, I think it's just human nature. But surely it would be easier for the government to issue a directive saying, no, actually, this is not cool, than it would be to mandate something insane, like yeah. you have to take off your shoes and you can't take bottled water onto a plane. Yeah. Yeah, well, there are some, uh, I'll give you some examples where they are doing that. So one, Brazil f said, we're only going open source. There's one government that at least went and said, we're only buying Linux because we want to promote that in our country. Um, as far as the U.S. government goes, there, it isn't all open quite that way. Mo it, there is a little bit more lockdown, I think, in many government groups. It's not universal because if you know anything about at least the American government, there's this group, that group, there, and they're all under different leaders. But you know, you see things that say, "Well, I can't reach my Hotmail from uh, my office computer. Um, I can't open up um, Acrobat files that have JavaScript in them. It actually fails. They'll push a GPO down that prevents that from happening. They'll block the zip files and the executables. So there's, that lockdown is happening, but there's pushback every time because you'll see something that says, uh, "You guys just block Shockwave." files, which have a vulnerability, and by the way, Adobe put out another patch today for Shockwave. Um, but then that broke my web-based training, and I'm trying to take my web-based training, and you block Shockwave, and now I can't take it. And so, you know, I, I guess it's the same problem we all have is happening inside the government. Yeah. Well, to the whole conspiracy theorists, I never ascribe to malice, but can be adequately explained by stupidity. Um, there is, and, there, and also why these aren't more locked down, it costs money. There's a measurable cost to locking things down, and maybe it's the right idea, but it's not free. Yeah. My actual question for you is, what, if anything, are you seeing with obfuscated content and payload, especially in emails? I worked with Richard Ahubney ages ago doing a MIME canonicalization engine, because we discovered you can create a MIME message where six different mail clients saw six different attachments. Yeah. So is that being seen in the wild, or is that still a theoretical vulnerability that oh, we're fortunate yeah. enough to not actually have to deal with yet? Yeah, they're, they're, they're <laughs> so, 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 so some great examples of this are you take an image, and then you take another image, and it's called steganography, and you can you know, smush the two together, and the original, you know, the, the sort of benign looking image of you know, your kid on the swing set, uh, actually contains something of interest. And it could be a text document or another image or it might be whatever. And, and you, you can do it with all kinds of stuff. And there are freeware tools all over to do it and there are more sophisticated ones. Um, I think the reason we do not know more or see more with steganography in our information security group is because we suck at finding it. We, there was a study done maybe two years ago that looked at the effectiveness of all of these different kinds of commercial tools that claim some ability to identify steganography. And they were, it was like actually, you know, it identified more false positives than it did, um, uh, false negatives than it did false positives. I mean, it was just totally messed up. But this, um, is, this isn't about steganography, it's about the MIME spec being crap. Mm -hmm. um, and that you, know, you can literally have two different mail clients get a normal mail message and have two different file names with different content that they save to disk. Your antivirus may be seeing a different but file you're, than you're your mail You're teaching me something yeah. new, so I'm gonna yeah, you're have not somebody take it a note okay. and go back and say, uh, are we seeing that? Yeah. Maybe, actually, Bill knows more about this than I do. I'll have to talk to you later. <laughs> Hi, I read a paper out of UIAUC a couple years ago about um, very simple modifications that can be done on the hardware level. Oh, sorry. I'm kind of deaf. Um, I read a paper a couple years ago out of UIUC that described very, a few very simple modifications that can be made at the hardware level to cause privilege escalation. 
and even something as benign as you know an ICMP packet that has a few bits clipped. Mm -hmm. Have you? Is this something on your radar? Because there is a lot of common hardware in a yeah. lot of the desktops I'm, and laptops. I'm again struggling to remember what I'm allowed to say and not say, so I'm working through some things here. Um, no, what's that number? You're supposed to be giving me a, a look to say if I can do it. All right, so it, it has been known, I'll speak very obtusely, it has absolutely been known that some of the hardware shipped that say um, Cisco uh, had some products and they were developed coincidentally in China. Sorry about that theme coming back, but um, they were developed with uh, fake, not fake hardware, but, but uh, it was uh, not quite to spec. Yeah, there you go. And, and so those things have happened before mm -hmm. and I am certain happen a lot. Uh, I know certainly we saw cases of USB hard drives, external hard drives, shrink wrapped in the box pre-loaded with malware. Um, I think there was obviously the very famous case of Sony devices being pre-loaded, you know. Uh, so that is on our radar. One of the things we're trying to do, and I, I haven't been successful at it yet, is that I'm trying to get some kind of program together where we could work with the vendors to baseline these products so that when we buy them, we can say, okay, here's a photograph of what the inside is supposed to look like. Um, this is, you know, what it looks like on the outside here, you know, that, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, here are some tests we can run uh, so that we know that the product we're buying meets the spec of the thing. Uh, the, f the more complicated issue of maybe somebody, a manufacturer, who their spec is designed to uh, cause us trouble, um, that's going to be even harder. They were, DARPA put out um, an RFI, RFP, about two years ago, actually trying to get people to come up with good ideas of how do we figure out if we buy this chip that it does only exactly what it's supposed to do. And uh, that's because US, uh, the US n no longer manufactures uh, chips. Very few places uh, actually have these kinds of uh, manufacturing places. Right? So I, um, we have to buy everything, even military product from overseas, mm. you know, in terms of chips and so on. So yeah, tough problem and, and we haven't, I haven't solved it. So I've actually been to China recently a couple times and been to Vietnam. When I, curiously enough, when I was in Vietnam, uh, I was working with a client there who was like running Telnet on everything and had 200 branches behind their firewall. And, and they said, oh no, no one ever breaks into anything in Vietnam. That doesn't happen. And I said, well, that's just, you don't know it. Yeah. But it, given, given that, you know, uh, no one's giving me a clean laptop when I go, uh, do you have suggest does uh, the, the, you or other people here have suggestions? I mean, I run Linux on my laptop, which presumably is an advantage uh, in this regard because most of the vectors appear that you've mentioned so far appear to be uh, Windows based. You know, Windows Windows executables. Any other than other than running Linux and, and anybody have other suggestions of things well, I should do to? Yeah, w one of the things that I know some of uh, my folks have done is they actually image their machine before they go or run. You know new VMs and that kind of thing. A and then when they come back, restore to a, a known prior good. Um, there, there are some gotchas there. I mean, if you're, if you're on a, I don't know what space you're in, what y you do, but uh, there is malware that gets installed inside your firmware. And that means that even if you pull out your hard drive and put in a new one, you're still had. Mm -hmm. um, but you can try to uh, image your machine and baseline it so that you can restore to a, a known good state when you get back. You know, if, you know, this is my only thing and all the rest. And I would definitely clean out anything you don't need with you that you wouldn't want to give out to the rest of the world. The, the other thing, and it has nothing to do with the security issue, but traveling abroad, um, other countries have very different rules about um, material and its legality, right? So you don't, I mean, I would avoid bringing any images or music and other things like that. Uh, there, there are issues around um, that, that, that music is offensive and is a crime, um, that music is Christian music and is uh, proselytizing and is a crime. Uh, those images of your kids playing in the bathtub in the backyard or whatever it is, the thing, the little pool, is kiddie porn and you're going to jail. And uh, so you, when you travel abroad, you, I, I would leave all of that stuff behind. Um, you know, just it's not worth the risk. Um, as far as Linux goes, um, the reason there aren't as many um, 
Well, I'm happy for that, right, actually. Yeah, you know, people, you know, all the tools are right there. SSH is just waiting to be used, and, and so, um, yeah. Uh, the, the socially engineered emails are, are there to try to get root access on the system, and um, you know, Unix isn't quite as, as prevalent, so it's not as much as, as a foothold target, but very often that's where the intellectual property is, and there are lots of techniques of jumping on a Linux box and mm -hmm. getting the data off once they get your neighbor's PC on your network. So they'll use him to get in, but once they're in, they'll go to your machine to get the good stuff. Okay, mm -hmm. thanks. So um, forgive me if the answer to this is obvious, but I'm thinking about, oh, my name is Julie Bauer. <laughs> Hi, Julie. Well, I'm management and nothing is obvious. It's <laughs> you just ask anything. Yeah. So if you talk about something like the flu virus that comes around every year, mm. um, and you know, people want to know, what are the symptoms? Um, what can I do to protect myself? What can I do to protect others? What are the things I need to be aware of? If I travel to country A or country B or country C, what, what should I be concerned about? Um, you know, there's standard places where I think your yeah, average person Yeah, the State Department website is the best. The State Department actually for, for that has a great data on countries and that's where we always go. Pull the sheet, they tell you what kind of um, illnesses are going on right now, any political strife, you know, what kind of crime is most common, uh, some of those gotchas on the laws like, you know, if you thought the picture of your kids playing in the backyard was cute, eh, don't bring it with you to this place. Right, yeah. so my question is, say for like your mother or my grandmother, whoever is not very computer savvy, mm. um, is that also where they go? Is You're talking about the government sort of wanting to make this a little bit more of an open discussion. Mm. Um, is, is there gonna be an effort? Is, is that gonna be, do we wanna be as open with this and will it be as centralized, you know, the, you know where you, the average person goes to get this kind of information um, as it is say for like, for health issues? Oh, so is, is this uh, sort of APT kind of discussion going to show up? Right. Uh, golly, I have not seen that happen yet, and that would be very interesting to see happen. Um, you know, I haven't, I'm going to have to check. There was a recent issue with um, United Arab Emirates pushing out um, a Trojan through uh, over the air updates to Blackberries. They gave, gives them a backdoor on your Blackberry with no, and they actually just had an update that gives uh, really great, um, it's a silent install. They got rid of some of the bugs so that it doesn't slow you down anymore and they can turn on the microphone and, you know, before it was kind of buggy and it would be kind of slow and they just fixed that. Um, so I, I'm going to have to go check and see if the State Department actually talks about it. My guess is they're probably not going to right now. Uh, will they? I'm, I'm kind of hoping because I think the only way we're going to solve this is by putting it on the table and then everybody will say, oh, all right, so now I need to take different action. But, yeah, good question. All right, thank you. Hmm. 